Okay, so with that, I'm just going to dive right into it. So to start, I wanted to talk about payments on IV. And this is a really important topic because payments and money in is what keeps your business going. Of course, in any business, you need to be profitable. You need to be collecting payments. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how IV allows you to manage your business by selecting and controlling the kinds of payments that you take and helping you manage those payments. So um, what I'm going to do to start is, let me go ahead, I believe everyone can see me okay and also hear me okay. And you should be able to see my screen below. So let me go ahead and just make this a little bit larger. Okay, perfect. So today, like I said, we're gonna talk about how to use Ivy to manage your payments. And there are a couple of key things to understand here when talking about payments on IV. The first is that IV understands that the nature of an interior designer and an interior design firm and an interior design project is that everything is subject to change. You're going to be in situations where pricing changes, where things get out of stock, where the client changes their mind and switches out one item for another. And any changes in these pricing that you might have already collected a payment on, it can lead to a challenge to keep everything organized in regards to where that money actually is. So the idea here is, and we're going to talk about this um, throughout the course of this webinar, is we are going to talk about an original payment versus an applied payment. Um, and the reason why this is important is because we just talked about those interior design projects where everything is subject to change, the pricing, the quantity, the stock, uh, your client's mind, whatever it is. So with an original payment versus an applied payment, we'll dive into this. And I want you to see how we don't limit you on where a specific payment can be applied. So if somebody actually submits a payment to you on an invoice and then submits a return, you'll see the original payment amount and then what is now an unapplied payment. So you can mark that elsewhere. And so we'll dive into that really deeply, but I wanted to just give you a little bit of background. Um, and in this way, when we divide up payments in an original payment versus an applied payment, we really are trying to have you take control of your business, manage your client and vendor relationships, be that middle person collecting the payment when you need to and defining those terms as well. So we're gonna start off, and if you've tuned into any of my recent webinars, uh, you know that I've talked about how much I love deposit payments on proposals. Um, and we'll come back to this slide, but I really wanna just go ahead and talk about the original payment and the applied payment throughout the course of this webinar and deposit payments. So deposit payments are so important and I'll articulate this and how to take care of this in IB, but there are a couple of reasons and places where you can collect a deposit payment and it truly depends on what you prefer to do. In this webinar, I'm going to talk about why I prefer to take deposit payments on proposals versus invoices, why I recommend that you do that, how deposit payments work, how they look, and how you can utilize progressive invoicing and retainers. We'll get to that. But the reason why I recommend that designers take a deposit payment on a proposal, I recommend 100% deposit payment. Because what did we just talk about? We talked about the need to be flexible. We talked about how things change. And all of those changes can take place within the proposal, and which will allow to greater flexibility in your project. An invoice has legal implications. Um, and another thing about taking payments on proposals is about protecting yourself and getting that cash flow. When you're buying tens of thousands of dollars of products for your client, you never want to front that money because that is money that you hope to see from your client. If you have a good agreement, you will see that, but you never know what can happen. So you're always gonna wanna collect that payment upfront. 
protect yourself, have that cash flow ready to go. Okay, so let's dive into all of these different things it directly in IV. So to start, I want to show you a couple different things. I want to start with how to collect a full deposit and how to collect a deposit in general and all the variations of a deposit. So why collect a deposit? Like I said, you want to protect yourself and you need that money up front. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on the proposal. Like I said, I recommend taking payments on proposals. It's the beauty of Ivy that we allow, that you, we allow you to do that. And all I need to do here in my project is click create new proposal. I'm going to add a couple of different products and services right over here from my product library. And I want to show you a couple different things here. So the first thing is we're talking about managing payments. What works for you? In the edit proposal mode, you can actually set the default payment terms for this proposal. So um, you'll see right over here at the top, it's defaulted to due on receipt. However, if you were to set this to net 15, net 30, net 60, or custom, where you set it the own, your own due date, you can do so here. And this is applicable to your invoices and your retainer documents as well. So in this case, I'm going to set it to net 30. And you'll see that my due date automatically changes to 30 days from now. So that's the first thing about managing your payments. Dictate when you need those payments and how you'll collect them. Okay, so um, specific to payments here, I want to tell you a little bit about this bottom right-hand corner over here. I'm just gonna zoom in. And we're talking about deposits. Why is it so important to collect a deposit? We want you to protect yourself and we want you to have that cash flow because interior design projects are dealing with large sums of money and you never want to pay out of pocket and front that money. Heard too many horror stories about that. So on IV, you can request a deposit in a couple different ways, a percentage or a dollar amount. I'm going to recommend collecting 100% deposit upfront. And what's great about this is because I'm actually defining this as 100%, no matter if, the, uh, if my client declines a few items, my total deposit request will remain as the total value of the actual proposal. Okay, so again, we're just collecting a deposit here. So one thing about deposits that's important to know, on any document, whether it's a proposal or an invoice, you can only collect one deposit. And I've heard some designers ask recently, especially, how do you, I want my client to pay me in multiple increments, or I want uh, to collect X amount of dollars instead of the total balance due. How do I do this? I've already requested a deposit. So this is where I was talking about, you are going to want to utilize progressive invoicing and retainers in this case. So let me go ahead and talk a little bit about that. So again, collect that deposit, collect that money up front. And you can send this off to your client for payment right over here, click send proposal. And you can request a deposit payment on this uh, proposal. And you can also give them the payment options, credit card or bank transfer. IV uses Stripe to process our payments. So it's 3% credit card payment uh, fee and 1.2% for bank transfers. You can offset that to your client right over here as most of you already know. Um, and if not, it will, the total fee will be deducted from the payout that you receive. In this case, just to expedite things for this uh, webinar, I'm going to go ahead and record the payment that I received. And I'll record a check payment for the full amount. Send a receipt to my client and click create. Now, with this, what I was just talking about, um, a few questions that I've received recently. Uh, I've had some designers say, okay, I'm invoicing, I created one invoice, and now I want to bill in increments. How can I do this? Well, the first thing that I would recommend is take advantage of progressive invoicing. Uh, we just launched an amazing update to this feature, which I'm so excited about. I'll show you what it looks like right now. 
um, which will allow you to do exactly that, to manage the payments that you bring in. So if you have collected a deposit for all three of these items, and yet the, P, uh, the your vendor is giving you different lead times uh, for each of these items, you can control when this payment is coming in and when you are issuing an invoice. Like I mentioned before, an invoice is has legal accounting implications. Uh, so you want to just make sure that when you create an invoice, you are sending it to your client as fast as, as you can. You do not want to be sitting on any invoices that you create. Um, and if you have any questions about that, I recommend you watch my webinar from last week about accrual, where I talked about accrual based reporting. So I just mentioned, uh, I just mentioned progressive invoicing and progressive invoicing is an amazing way for you to manage your payments because you can determine exactly what you are creating invoices for from your proposal. Again, start from the proposal. So what I'll do over here is I'm clicking in the top right hand corner and I'm clicking start invoice. And you will need to first enable progressive invoicing in your company settings to, uh, to enable you to do this. Um, and I could show you what that looks like a little bit later, but this is what it will look like. You can show all of the, you'll see all of the different approved items on this proposal. In this case, I collected a payment on it, so it's assumed that they were approved. And I can also select the items for which I want to create an invoice. So this allows you to bill incrementally. Um, if you only want to officially create the invoice for the item as it comes in, no problem. This is a, the best way to do so, progressive invoicing from the proposal. You can even select the amount of money that you want to transfer from the proposal to the invoice. This is so exciting. Um, I've, I'm so excited that this came out last week. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to create an invoice only for this area rug. And what's great about this is that this document has some flexibility to it. While we're editing it, this is our opportunity to update this for any changes that we've received from the vendor or any changes that our client has, re has requested. For example, they say, you know what, that rug, we decided to get two of it. No problem, I'm gonna change the quantity to two. Or the vendor comes back and says, okay, great, I now have the shipping for this item. Fantastic, I'm gonna add the shipping cost right over here. Um, I can edit this right now while I'm creating the invoice. The proposal gives you the flexibility to collect that estimate and that deposit. And then the invoice is where you can collect the payment on the final cost. Once again, you have those payment terms that we saw earlier. And you'll see now, I do not have an option to, uh, to create, uh, to request a deposit. I already had collected a deposit on the original uh, connected document. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and save this. And this is really going to lead me to a couple of different things that I want to talk about. So this invoice now has a balance due. Um, let's say I collected this. Uh, okay, I have a couple of different things that I want to get into right now. So we're talking about progressive invoicing where you can create invoices for items as they come in. Absolutely utilize this setting. Um, it will be a really great help for managing the process of items in their life cycle in your project. But I also wanna talk about credits and retainers because we're talking about payments. And inevitably, credits and retainers are an amazing tool for you to utilize because they give you the flexibility. They allow you the flexibility of what if things change, as inevitably they will throughout the course of an interior design project. So I'm gonna toggle over to the next slide and then we'll jump into credits and retainers. And one last thing before I get into that, I just want you to remember, we're talking about original payments and applied payments. So, We'll get into that in just a second. Uh, and, and I just want you to keep that original payment versus applied payment in mind. Okay, so let's go ahead. So retainers, what are retainers and how can you utilize them? If you're not yet utilizing a retainer, I highly recommend doing so. 
Um, retainers are an amazing way for you to protect yourself and for you to just, yeah, protect yourself ultimately. Collect money from your client upfront. So there are three key use cases that I've seen um, that designers will utilize retainers. So the first one is as a security deposit. As a part of the agreement, upon signing up for a specific project, a designer can issue a retainer and say, I'm going to collect from you $5,000 up front, and I want this to serve as a security deposit should anything go wrong, should you go AWOL, obviously you don't want to tell them that, or should things fall sour, at least I'm protecting myself with money, I'm collecting a security deposit. What I'll do at the end of the project, I will apply this $5,000 payment to the final invoice, just like a normal apartment would, would do when you give them a security deposit and you can essentially use that security deposit as the last month's rent. Same thing here, same principle, use a retainer as a security deposit. You can. Another use case for retainers is to bill in phases. So sometimes you'll talk about project budgets and uh, project phases. So a project from start to finish might actually be broken up into three or four different phases. And one way to give your client an ease of use or just an ease of payment would be to collect a lump sum of money upfront for a specific phase. So this is what I've seen designers do. Uh, they'll collect $50,000 for phase one, $50,000 for phase two, and they will utilize that retainer as payment for any invoices that come about during that phase. So that's one way to do so, just something to think about. You can manage your client's money as you need to in a way that works for your business. Okay, and then um, in the same way, in the same mentality, um, some designers will also prefer to give their clients just they, they don't want to issue invoices throughout the course of a project. They don't want to issue 15 different invoices. Instead, their client just says, the project budget is $100,000. Here's a check for $100,000. I want to approve everything, but I don't want to see each individual invoice. Okay, no problem. This is a really easy way to give your client a positive experience is by creating a retainer, that lump sum payment, no matter how you collected it, and um, and applying that payment to all of the future invoices. So it's the same idea as a, as a project phase retainer, but a different, you can do this for retainers, for furniture specifically, for your design fees, for time billing. I've seen it broken down in a, one individual project into each of those different things. So there's a couple different ways that you can do this. Um, and then the last, Point about this. I want to talk about how to record a large payment and whether to use retainers or credits or both. Okay, so I'm going to jump back into Ivy here. We're talking about retainers. We're talking about managing your client's money and how you can utilize retainers to do this. So we'll come back to this invoice in just a second, but you have within your pro project in Ivy the credits and retainers tab. And this will allow you to oversee all of the different retainers that you have available, all the credits that you have available. In this case, I have a lot of both, but no problem. All I'm going to do is request a new retainer to show you exactly what this looks like. So here, I'll just click request new retainer. And I can set my payment terms again nifty, net 15, net 30, net 60, whatever it is. Um, and I can also create a retainer name. So in this case, let's say I'm going to call this furniture retainer, just like I mentioned in that last slide, and we'll call this $75,000 and save it. And retainers are interesting. So sometimes Questions will come in from designers. They'll say, my client handed me a check for $75,000. How do I manage this? What do I do with it? How do I record this? Well, one way is to create a retainer. And the retainers, you don't actually need to send them to your clients. If you've already collected that check payment or if you collected it offline, you can simply record that payment that you received 
um, just like this without actually publishing it to them, without actually sending it to them. And then the money will exist within this client's account. So all I'm going to do here, I have my $75,000 retainer request. I'm going to add a new payment and record the payment that is received. If I send this to my client via Ivy, I can of course request that they pay this online via um, bank transfer or credit card. So in this case, I'm going to just say my client paid me by check and create the payment right over here. So now I have a balance of $75,000 of retainer money that I can apply to future proposals or invoices. So in order to create this application, all I'm going to do is go back to that invoice that we had initially just worked on. And you'll see over here, this was partially paid. We had added the shipping costs. So now there's a little bit of a difference here. So what I'm going to do is click add new payment, record received payment, and you'll see over here that I have a note that says you have available credits and retainers that can be applied. All I need to do here is select check and record my reference number. Okay. So I'm going to pay the difference. Now I can see the two different payments that I've received. I have my, oops, you know what? I just got distracted. I needed to apply a retainer right over here. Totally my bad. I'm going to re-record that payment, apply a retainer, and then I can choose the retainer for which I'm applying this. So I'm going to apply $200 and create this retainer right over here. So now my retainer balance is going to go down and I have two individual payments. One is the applied retainer and one is the check. And you'll see that word, it might sound familiar to you, applied retainer. Remember, we have an original payment amount, and then we have the retainer application. We have the applied payment. So remember that check, um, when we first created this invoice, it came from a proposal. Let me try to zoom in here on my screen. But when we first created this, when we first created that first payment on the, on the proposal, um, remember that we recorded the total payment for the entire cost of the proposal, which was $7,903.50. So you'll see that total payment. That is the original payment. And that original payment gives you the flexibility to apply it in multiple different places. So here we have the amount applied on this invoice, $2,090. If we needed to, you'll see that total payment will remain unchanged because that was our original payment receipt. And then the application of it might change. We might have a return. We might have a credit created. Um, so just remember, you can see what the total payment, the original one was, and then the application of it. Okay, so going back to retainers. So this retainers are one way that you can also uh, bill for your clients in multiple increments. So for example, I mentioned earlier, I have a client, um, I, have a, I have a designer who just said uh, that they had one invoice and they want to collect payment on it one at a time. Um, I can issue a retainer for any given amount that I need and collect it and apply it as a payment to that invoice. So that's one way for you to take advantage of retainers as well. Okay, um, perfect. So what I want to go move on to is a little tip and trick about creating credit. So what exactly is a credit? A credit gives you the flexibility to uh, allow for anything that naturally occurs in your interior design process and your interior design project. It gives you the ability to plan for returns, exchanges, um, your client changing their mind, things being out of stock. So let's talk about credits a little bit and how you there i want to show you two different cool things that you could do with credits so um i'll come back right over here so with credits one thing that you want to do is make sure that when you create a credit in a project there's either a quick turnaround of the application of this credit because it is your client's money still and it's now unapplied um, 
it's not attached to any invoice or, uh, or anything like that. So you don't necessarily want to sit on unapplied payments for too long, especially credits. Uh, so what we recommend doing when you create a credit is utilize that credit as payment on the next available invoice. And what that will allow you to do is increase transparency with your clients. So I'm going to get into this process right now, um, but it's always great to be transparent with your client. You want to say, hey, remember that return? It resulted in a $2,000 credit. I just applied it to, to this invoice. Here's my invoice for the, for the balance due now. And you want to maintain, with payments especially, which is such a sensitive topic, you want to maintain that transparency and that trust with your client. So let me go back into IV over here. And I'm gonna go into a different invoice right over here that I have. So I'm over here going to record a payment for the full amount. And I will record this for 6820. Excuse me. So this is one way that you can actually create a credit. So we just talked about what happens if your client um, pays you a lump sum of money, uh, and I recommend creating a retainer. It's the easiest for accounting purposes. It just makes for really clean accounting. You know that you have X amount of dollars. You have the reference number. But another way that you can do this is by recording the original payment and the application of the uh, and the application of that payment. So remember, we have an original payment amount, we have the application, and this is what allows you for increased flexibility. So what I have over here is I had an invoice for $6,800. Let's say my client miraculously overpaid me for this. Um, who knows when that could actually happen? But let's say they did. Let's say they accidentally wrote me a check for $7,820. They misread. So what I can actually do is I can record the full amount of that check payment right over here, add my reference number here, which I'm going to say is my check number. And they paid me 7820. I want to specify the amount to apply to this invoice. So you won't actually be able to apply a payment greater than the balance due. So all I'm going to do here is apply the total balance due. Remember, we said they overpaid us by $1,000. This is an easy way to record it. We're recording the original amount and then we're recording the application of it. Always remember, original versus application. And with this, I'm gonna create a payment and I wanna show you what's really cool over here. Now you'll see that this is recorded as a full payment for this entire balance due. But what happened? What happened to that extra $1,000? All I need to do is click on see details and look at my applied payments. And again, the total payment is the original payment amount. The amount applied is the full balance. And you'll see this line that says credited from invoice. This way of recording the overpayment actually resulted in a credit in this project for that overpayment. So this is one way, if you don't wanna use a retainer for that extra amount, if you wanna just keep things, okay, they overpaid me on this invoice, I'm gonna record it as a credit, this is a really amazing way to do so. You can only do this on invoices. You cannot create credits from uh, in this way from proposals. So this credit now lives within the project. And we talked about credits, they allow for flexibility. They give you the ability to plan for those changes that inevitably come up within a project. Uh, stock is out, uh, prices change, shipping costs increase or decrease miraculously. But I wanna show you where that payment lives and it's in the credits and retainers tab down here. And you'll see it right down here at the bottom. And you'll see the payment reference number that we recorded, which is the check number. You'll also see the full payment amount. This is the original payment that we received. So it allows us to easily cross-reference our deposits and what we have here in Ivy and the remaining credit within this specific credit line item that I have. So what's amazing about this is you're able to utilize this credit as a payment on an upcoming invoice. So I'll show you what that looks like now, but I wanted to first show you where that lives. 
and where that credit balance lives within the project. If you ever need to, if you come to the end of a project and you happen to have a, some sort of credit balance due um, on that project, you can click issue refund here and it will zero out IV, it will zero out your um, credits and retainers tab. It will not actually issue a refund. So this will allow you to just zero it out, reconcile your account, um, but you'll still need to issue a refund offline, whether that is uh, whether that is by check or some other sort of payment. Okay, so talking about that application of the credit, how do you apply a credit? It's just as you applied a retainer payment earlier. So the way to do this, um, all you need to do is click add new payment. And you'll see, once again, you have that note, you have retainers and credits that can be applied, record the received payment, and apply a credit. And you'll see the credit that I have available. It's unbelievable, I have so much credit here. I'm gonna record a payment for the full amount right over here. And now this will be, you'll see the credits that this came out of. It automatically takes it out of the different credits that I have available. And again, you can see that original payment and then the application of the payment. Okay, so it makes it just really easy to identify when you understand the original payment and then the applications of the payments and all their different formats. It just helps keep things organized in your mind. <laughs> um, Ellie is letting me know that we have a question. So let me just look for it. Um, I'll let Ellie tell me the question. Martha is asking, can you apply credit on past invoices too? Say I have two invoices at the same time. The client makes one payment for both at the same time. Yeah, um, absolutely. If you can always, so first of all, Credits will live within the project itself. So you want to make sure that um, this client has the same project open. You can't necessarily apply credits across different projects, um, but absolutely. So let's say your client made that one payment for both at the same time. You can do this in two different ways. So first you can record that one payment as a retainer and apply that retainer to both invoices. Or just as we, just did earlier, you can record um, the check payment for the full amount on the invoice, specify the amount to apply, and it will create a credit of the difference, which you can use to apply to the next, uh, to the next invoice that you need. So I hope that helped. Um, and then, Okay, so uh, somebody was asking, Kim, Kim Harrison's asking, can you explain the original payment further? The original invoice was $2,290. Where did that $7,800 come from? So Kim, when we're talking about original payments, that specific original payment came from the proposal itself. I had recorded a payment on the proposal and then I converted the proposal to an invoice. So while the payment portion had converted from the proposal to the invoice, it's still showing you what that original payment on the proposal was. So I'm gonna come right over here back to our original proposal. And you'll see over here the total payment that I, that I have on this, uh, that, I, that I have on this proposal that I recorded was 7903. I then invoiced one item for, it was 2270 at the time. And then I was able to see what the total payment was, which was this original check payment, and then what was applied to that specific invoice. So I hope that clarifies things a little bit. Okay. Um, so moving on, um, I wanted to talk about uh, one other way that you can create credits. And credits, again, we want to make sure, one thing that you can do is really, uh, is really increase the transparency that you have with your client. Um, and the way to do that is when you have a credit in a project, it's really great to use the existing credit that you have because your client has already given you that money. You can use that existing uh, credit onto the next invoice and then you can issue that invoice for the balance due. 
So let's say over here, I only have $200 in credit. I'm going to be issuing this invoice directly to my client, but before I do, I wanna show them I'm using up that $200 of credit. All I need to do here is click add new payment, record the payment that I receive, and I'm going to just apply the 200 in a hypothetical way and create this payment. And what you'll see here is now there's a balance due for the remaining balance. And your client, when they receive this invoice and when they view it, they're able to see the exact payment application of the credit. They can see that payment's re reference number. And then they can see that they owe you only $21.10. So this is a really easy way to remain transparent and to increase that trust with your client as well. We recommend a quick turnaround on the application of credits so that you're just not sitting on your client's money as it pertains to credits. So um, inevitably, in any interior design project, what's gonna happen? Uh, your client's gonna love an item, it arrives. If you don't have no exchanges or returns in your policy, they might decide that they want to exchange or return something, or it's been it's been out of stock by the by the vendor. So I want to show how to handle returns and refunds in IEB um, because this is again where we utilize credits. So let's say this area rug, our client paid for it. You could see the exact payment that we had recorded. Um, or let me go into one which maybe has a couple different items on it. This has two items or upholstery service, yes. Okay, so I'm going to go into here. I can click edit this invoice and there's a couple different ways, but the, the whole idea of creating a credit, um, if you are not recording a payment greater than the actual balance of the invoice is you want to reduce the balance of a paid invoice. That is how you create a credit. And it makes sense, right? You already collected that payment. Now you need to reduce it. And whatever that reduction is, is going to be the credit that you have. So let's say my upholstery service, they have quoted me $500. They come back and tell me, actually, you know what? Special deal because we love you. It's $250. So I can either edit the cost over here directly and I can add a note I would recommend adding a note here uh, to my to my description saying um, discount received or another option would be if this armchair was completely out of stock um, and I need to eliminate this for my invoice altogether there are a couple different ways that you can do this so again we're trying to lower the balance of this paid invoice the easiest and cleanest way, in my opinion, to do this is to zero out the quantity of this item because it will allow you to keep a record of the original item, but at this point, it's going to be a zero balance. And here, once again, you can add a note saying out of stock. The alternative is you can also add a negative line item as a return if you want to. In my opinion, this is the easiest way to do it, but the return is helpful. Um, if you, all you need to do is click add new item, all services. And let's see if I have a product in here that I've created called return. And there is, I've created a product called return. This will allow me to add the negative value of this, of this item. And it will exactly that, it will reduce the balance of this invoice by that amount. The last alternative that you can do to create a credit would be to delete the line item. I don't like that. I have short term memory. It's hard for me to remember. And when I delete the item, it's gone forever. So I like having the record of what it started with and why it was changed to zero, just like this. So this is a paid invoice. Remember, this return came about. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to click Save, and I get a pop-up notification that says, you're about to reduce the balance, the paid balance by $6,115. Are you sure you want to proceed? Okay. And now, once again, you're going to see 
we created a credit for that amount. So this is where I can see that exact credit. I could see the original payment, what is applied to this invoice, and what has been credited from this invoice. This credit lives within the project. I can use it on as many invoices as I need until I occupy or until I use up the entire credit balance. Okay, I know that that's a lot. I know that it's Labor Day weekend and it's supposed to be like a fun weekend, um, but I hope that this is fun. Um, last two things I wanna go over in this payment topic is uh, two things, how to set up your, how to track online payments. If you wanna take online payments in IV, all you need to do is go into my account, click on the payments tab, only the administrator on the account will be able to see this, and this will allow you uh, to connect your bank account to IV in order to collect deposits, to collect the, the payment deposits. Um, really easy to do, we use Stripe to process our payments. But I wanna show you where you could track your payments and then two reports that you could pull that will be relevant to you, and then we'll wrap up, um, and I'll take some questions. So I'm gonna go into my projects tab over here and click on all projects. And this is one of my favorite parts because you can see a bird's eye view of all of the different proposals, invoices, POs across your projects. But this is specifically for payments. So if you had your bank account connected and you had taken online payments, it would look a little something like this. The top half of this page would show you any pending payments with an expected pay date. And then the bottom half would look just like this, where it would show you the invoice, the client, the payment date, and then when it was deposited into your account and the total payment amount. If you ever wanna see manual payments associated with it, all you need to do is click check mark, show manual payments. But this is one way for you to track the status of your online payments that you receive. And when we're talking about payments, Yes, we've talked about original versus applied. We've talked about credits, we've talked about retainers, we've talked about deposits. But we have two reports in IV that are relevant to payments that I really want to, uh, that I want to show you what those look like. So all you need to do here is toggle over to the reports tab. And we're gonna look at the project payments report and the IV online payment breakdown. So the project payments report allows you to pull a report for a specified period of time or all periods of time. And you can also select it for all of your projects or on an individual project basis. And I already have one that I ran earlier today. And this will also be vital to helping you understand the payments that you've received and their applications. So remember, we talked about original payments and applied payments. And this very easily gives you the breakdown. It organizes it by date automatically. And this is important to understand. You'll see the actions here, payment received, payment applied. Remember, we talked about the fact that one payment could have multiple applications. That could be a retainer. That could be a payment which you received which resulted in a credit. We have the original payment amount and the application of it. So this will show you both. This will show you the original payment amount and what has been applied from that payment. So in this case, it's safe to assume I had received this $6,000 uh, payment, reference number 1234, and only $4,800 of it was applied. I can infer that there is a $1,200 credit with the same reference number from this original payment in my project. But I wanna show you how retainers look because retainers are amazing. And sometimes when you have those large retainers that I was talking about, it could be hard to remember where those retainers are actually applied. And this report breaks it down for you so easily. So all I need to see here is retainer. I know it's a retainer because I see RR. And I could see that I've received a retainer for $500. Of that $500, what's been applied? $250 to this proposal number 10120. Same thing over here, I collected a retainer for $50,000. In this case, there are no applied pay uh, payments on this payment. And let me see if I have any other examples. It seems I just collect 
retainer payments. Oh, here we go. Here's a good one. Um, I collected a $50,000 retainer and it has three different applications. So this is one way that you are able to see the distribution of those payments and allow you to manage your payments a little bit better. You'll see that this also, if you were taking online payments, this would show you the processing fee and if you charge it to your client. And if you're connected to QuickBooks, it would also have the payment reference right over there. The next payment that the next payment report that I talked about was the online payment breakdown. This you can just only pull for across your entire company and you can specify the date range. And I don't take online payments on my demo account, but I want to show you what this looks like. It'll show you um, the transfer date, what the expected pay date, when you can expect to see that in your account, the total tra transfer amount, the payment breakdown, the dates, the project, the document, and the document link, and the ID of the transfer. So this is really, really helpful when you're talking about reconciling your bank statement. Your online payment breakdown will allow you to do so very easily. Okay. So I hope that this, I, I can't believe it's already been like more than 45 minutes that flew by for me. Um, so let's just talk about the breakdown of what we just learned. Original payments versus applied payments. Really important to understand an original payment can have multiple applications. Um, deposit payments on proposals. Why do I prefer them? Mm -hmm. Fix your cash flow problem and protect yourself. How to utilize progressive invoicing um, and how to utilize retainers. Take advantage of both. Bill when you're ready using progressive invoicing and use retainers as a security deposit to bill for project phases or to collect that lump sum payment. Also with credits, how to create a credit. We looked at returns and exchanges and we looked at an overpayment from a client um, and our suggestions to turn around those applications very quickly and to increase transparency and client trust. And lastly, how to set up your account for online payments, track the payments directly from IV and utilize the project payments report and the online payment breakdown. Those all of those things will give you the flexibility to manage your payments and control the way that you do business in a way that works for you. Okay, so I'm gonna open the floor up to some questions uh, and I'll get through as many as I can right now. I hope that if, you, if I don't get to any, um, please feel free to email your dedicated account manager at support at iv.co and also take a look at our help center help.iv.co okay um so uh tim hodges is asking will you only use progressive invoicing if you do not collect a deposit on the proposal actually no um i would utilize progressive invoicing if you have one proposal directly uh, with multiple vendors uh, and, and which could result in different lead times. So it's actually, I would totally recommend progressive invoicing if you're collecting a deposit on the proposal. Um, the reason being is it gives you the flexibility to create that invoice when you're ready to. Um, I don't wanna talk about this in too much detail because I don't want your heads to explode, but Ivy, um, works on uh, the tax reporting on an accrual basis. So any invoice that you create, you owe taxes on in that period. So even if your client doesn't pay you yet, you still owe taxes on it. Progressive invoicing allows you to control for that. So you can create an invoice only when you're ready to collect payment and therefore pay taxes on it. Okay. Um, so I hope that helps. I would always use, utilize progressive invoicing, especially the update. Um, Mandy's asking, wouldn't it be easier to just tell them and get a new check or payment or at least ask if they're okay with what you decide? I don't know what that's in reference to, um, to credits. Uh, so to credits, oh, oh, I think we were talking about the overpayment perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. It's totally up to you. Um, you know, if this is a trustworthy client that you know that you have, you're at the start of the project and you know you will have other applications for it, sure, request another check. Um, and ask them what they want. It's totally up to you. These are just suggestions on how you can record those overpayments or using retainers or credits. Um, but 
totally up to you. You you manage your relationship with your client. Okay. Kathleen Blake is asking if we've got multiple projects for the same client and one large payment help. Um, so uh, Ivy is a project-based system. I would always recommend having one project per client just to make things easier on those payments. Um, in this case, it would be a little bit more difficult uh, What you because it would be, I think, a little bit harder to reconcile that one large payment. So what I would do, let's say I collected a $50,000 payment from that client and I have two different projects with them, I can record a retainer for $25,000 and then I would record a retainer for $25,000 in the other project and then apply that because at the end of the day, I do have that $50,000 in my bank account. I did re re receive that payment, but it is a little bit more tricky because IV is a project-based system. I would always recommend having one client, one project. Okay. Um, Aurora, if you pay for an item with a client's credit card, how do you invoice for your profit percentage on that item? Um, so I guess I have a follow-up question for you, Aurora. Um, are you paying the vendor directly or are you paying, are you paying on behalf on the invoice that you collect? I would always recommend on Ivy, especially utilize the markup abilities that you have but be the middle person between your client and your vendor. Don't, don't use your client's um, card to pay your vendor directly. I mean, if you really want to record that markup, unless you have some sort of agreement with them where you're saying, I'm going to pay the vendor directly, but you also owe me separately from that $300 as a procurement fee, um, then you could just create an invoice for $300. But what's really nifty here um, is that in Ivy, you can actually pay on behalf of your client on this invoice. So I would recommend dictating that relationship between your client and your vendor. You can present the clients to the, the clients, all of the items with the markup. For all intents and purposes, that is the cost of the item. They don't need to know your vendor's cost. And then if you're paying on their behalf with a credit card, You'll see over here in manage mode, I have the markup already included in this cost. When I'm going to add a new payment, I can click pay on behalf of your client. I can offset the transaction fee to my client if I want to, and then enter the credit card information, which will allow me to pay on behalf of my client right over here. So I did have a follow-up question for you, Aurora, if it was paying your vendor directly, if so, you would want to invoice a separate procurement fee. This is how I would recommend doing it though. I would recommend paying on behalf of your client on the invoice, which includes your markup. Okay, cool. Um, fantastic. And then one more question from Kathleen Blank. And then Ellie, do we have, uh, do we have any other questions? Okay, cool. Um, so Kathleen, which report can we send to our client for them to see distribution? Um, distribution of the payments, I assume? I would send them the project payment report. Uh, the project payment report doesn't have any incriminating information as it pertains to vendors or vendor costs. This will show them the exact breakdown of the distribution. So they'll see over here the payment reference, one, two, three, four, uh, the original payment amount and where it's been applied on that invoice. So this is the report I would send to your client if they ever do want that. Um, or if they want to see the retainer, they'll say, hey, I paid a retainer. Like, can you tell me the status of that retainer? Yeah, no problem. I can manipulate this. I'm in Excel. I'm in Google Sheets. I can manipulate this. Show them only the retainers in those applications. It totally depends on what you need to do. Okay, and one last question from Kim. When selecting charge client transaction fee, show the, does selecting, no, show the credit card charge as a line item on the invoice. No, it does not. That's a great question. Um, when charge client transaction fee, you can see it in two different ways. Um, so let's say in the document settings over here, let me go ahead and charge my client the transaction fee. Let me see if this works one second. I'm just going to go into preview mode over here. So there are two ways that your client can see this. Um, so the first one, they go to pay now. Okay, so I need to publish this document in order for them to see it, so I need to send it to them. Um, but when I go to pay now, 
on my client's end, this is what it would look like. And it would say credit card plus 3.1% or bank transfer plus 1.2%. So it will really easily show them over here, the credit card percentages. And then if you are paying on their behalf, it will not show up as a line item um, because uh, it just it, it just won't. Uh, you need it, if you wanna add that as a line item, I would recommend adding it actually to your memo section to say, by the way, <laughs> total cost with, uh, with credit card processing fee is going to be $36,418. Uh, so, and then you can always, send them a receipt once you record that payment you can always send them a receipt for that payment directly from here there would be a little blue button with an arrow that says send receipt when you hover over it okay judy one last question um i was wondering what makes it easier for the client just keeping the proposal rather than sending them the follow-up invoice how can you keep your client from feeling overwhelmed um I think that's a question that is, you know, subject to however your your specific client feels. Um, when so one way that okay, a couple different ways that you can ease the client experience. Uh, if they feel overwhelmed by getting invoices emailed to them, one thing that you can do is you can actually share the project dashboard with your client at the start, and you, you have this little uh, connected dots bu button right over here. And you can send it to them and what that will allow them to do is they can keep up to date with any invoices or proposals that are outstanding or have been closed so that's one way that you can show them everything um, which is a little bit less overwhelming but if your client does feel overwhelmed by the receipt of invoices i would make sure i would probably collect a retainer um, if that is possible because then you could say okay judy i'm collecting ten thousand dollars for my design services and for products for now. Here's a $10,000 retainer request. And I can promise you, I will get approval on all of the items that I'm going to buy first. So you can create that proposal for approval only and then apply the retainer there. So I would say that that's probably the least overwhelming in my opinion, is just getting that one retainer you inevitably will always have to create an invoice because an invoice has uh, official accounting impl implications. So you'll need to create an invoice um, regardless, even if you don't send it to your client. Okay, perfect. So I really appreciate you guys spending your Labor Day Friday with me. Um, I'm gonna send you a recording of this. If you wanna watch this at your own accord, feel free. The next two Fridays, we will not have uh, these webinars. So I do apologize if you will miss this part of your week. I certainly will. Um, and if you ever have any questions, check out our IV training page. It is a game changer. It shows you actually all of the breakdowns of the different webinars that I've hosted in the past. Uh, you'll see it right over here. It's ivy.co slash IV training. You have an easy access to the Health Center over here, which has articles and questions. Um, and then you'll also see over here, you can watch past webinars. I highly recommend watching this one if you haven't already. It's my favorite webinar I've ever done, and I think it's really helpful. And you'll see past webinars, uh, training on QuickBooks, whatever you need. And uh, you'll also see how some other designers use Ivy as well. So. Um, I really appreciate it. If you ever have any questions, email support at ivy.co and you can reach out to me with any questions about this webinar as well, Sivan at ivy.co. So thank you so much for joining me and I hope you guys have a great day.